in so many ways, I think everything that we've heard this morning um, really starts to, I think, typify the, the, the big battles that we have on our hands. I think nowhere more is the battle for capitalism alive than in Unilever. I think everybody who's been following um, the sustainable living plan and how core that is to the growth of the organization realizes that, um, was it conscientious capitalism? Yes, compassionate. Uh, compassionate capitalism. That is really an organization that is, that is showing leadership and showing the way forward for so many. And I think when you combine that with, with India, um, in my long 20-year tenure of trying to commercialize and scale solutions to the world's biggest problems, one of the places that I always came to first with a big idea was to India. Um, not just because of the fact that one in 10 people on the planet are an Indian villager, but because of the incredible entrepreneurial spirit of the Indian people and the ability to create communities at scale that I think really speak to what Olaf is talking about, which is um, the power of social movements, which is really, I think, still ingrained in the, in the culture here. So the battleground for humanity, for me, is right here in India. The battleground for capitalism, I think, is, is right there with, with Unilever. And I think those two things combined uh, with Zinthio building coalitions that can enable those things to really happen with all of the partners, I think it's incredibly exciting. So I'd love you to tell me a little bit, Pradeep, just about um, what, what you are doing. And, and from Polymateria's perspective, our, our business, we're really focused on plastic um, pollution as an issue. So I'd love to hear a lot about your, your waste to resources agenda and what you're doing really to, to bring that to life here. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. And I cannot help but uh, reflect over what we heard this morning, starting with uh, uh, almost all the speakers who came on board. And it becomes ab abundantly clear uh, for companies like us, for uh, small companies, large companies, any, uh, any uh, enterprise for that matter, that we will need to figure out a new model of growth in which we decouple the impact we have on the business from what we do. Clearly, we will not survive unless we grow and generate the economic wealth to do all of that. But these two are today linked in a manner, and, uh, and we need to figure out what the new model is. Uh, and if I completely zero on in, in fact, I don't know, maybe you had an inkling of what is going to happen. You open the papers these days, and you will see plastics written all over. Uh, and all of that comes from a very simple thought that we need to do this urgent burning platform on plastics globally. Uh, we heard the uh, numbers, 8 million tons do actually figure, uh, finally pass on to the seas. In India, if you take, uh, for many reasons historically, uh, out of the 300,000 tons we produce, uh, use in this uh, country, roughly 40% does get recycled. But the fact is, 15,000 tons a day we are producing, one third of that does not even get collected. So there is a burning platform, clearly. And companies like ours and com like-minded uh, organizations you saw on the board, they will need to come together to have a solution, to have a, be a part of a solution, uh, working with NGOs, working with governments, working with like-minded organizations, which really cracks that model where you decouple the impact of growth from the impact we have, uh, decouple the impact of uh, growth from what we do with the, the planet. Uh, and companies like Unilever for the last 10 years, you heard Sanjeev speak about it. We have practicing. It's become core to what we do. Uh, from, our, from the brands we take to the consumers, from the way we do our internal systems, from the way we uh, uh, design our campaigns, and so on. And let me give you some examples. If I take from 2010, Unilever, by the way, which globally, if you take, is probably 0.1% of the uh, uh, waste which we generate off of the uh, uh, packaging material we use, if we put everything together. But the, the awareness is so high. We are running a very strong, extremely strong uh, program on reduce for the last 10 years. If I take right here in our Homeland, we have reduced almost 45% of the waste which we generate. We have taken away 28% of the total plastic which we use uh, in our packaging. Uh, we have been working with uh, institutes in Germany uh, to actually fundamentally work on processes which can uh, restore plastics in any form to its original, almost at the molecular level, so that you can truly get into a circular economy. And uh, the trend really is to get into a stage where we get from the current linear way of thinking into economy which is truly circular to the extent of partnering with uh, the, uh, the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, and the solutions are there. We need to, be, we need to stay the course. Uh, and uh, I cannot help but I learn a new term uh, today uh, that uh, the ice indeed is thin. Uh, 
so we will need to move faster. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I think that the analogy of the ice being thin um, is, is probably um, a good cue for me to talk about the, the global context. Um, it's great to hear about uh, so much leadership um, happening here and, and the projects that you're, you're kind of driving forward, I think, are, are an example to the, to the global community. Um, as I look at the way plastic has captured the public mindset, it's amazing to me over the last even just six months, how it's become so emblematic of humanity's um, conflict with the, with the biosphere. Um, and it's captured the mindset of everybody in a way that um, the hole in the ozone layer, frankly, didn't. Um, our carbon emissions, our methane emissions, or even our water challenges haven't captured the public mindset the way this has. And I think the reason for that is it's so visible and it's so obvious to our children, it's so vi visible and obvious to, to businesses, to government, there's really no escaping it. So it just really took um, um, uh, David Attenborough and the BBC and, and a few other uh, big campaigns to, to really mobilize people and raise awareness and advocacy like nothing else um, I've ever seen. But I still think globally, in spite of your leadership here, we're just playing around the edges on this issue. When you look at how plastic is linked to global GDP growth, I anticipate that this year, globally, we'll produce about 500 million tons of plastic from 450 million tons last year. And when you project forward, linking to GDP again, we're going to hit a billion tons within the next two decades. Yet we're not bringing the same rigor and the same collaborative ethic that we heard about this morning into tackling that that we did that led to a successful outcome with, with Paris, with the climate change agreement where civic society, government and business all pulled together. We don't know what the capital costs are of solving that billion ton problem. We're not thinking about the, the 400 million tons that we used to have, but projecting forward and thinking about what do we need to do to scale up recycling um, programs or waste recovery programs and being as circular as possible? Decoupling from petroleum-based feedstock, so looking at other alternatives to, to bioplastics, but at the moment most bioplastics don't biodegrade and will hit a lot of the same um, limitations that some of the other biofuels uh, um, um, experienced. Um, and, and then there's actually reinventing polymers themselves, plastic themselves, which is where our business comes in. Um, and there's a real risk that I think we, we demonize plastic because of this incredible awareness that's going on globally that we, we ban it. Um, and I think certainly we, we do need to reduce our use, but we need to do that by understanding what the alternatives are and full life cycle analysis and having that data available. What I, what I pull out from the global community is there was a big rush to ban um, or set uh, reduction targets on um, petrol uh, engines uh, over the last decade or so, and that drove sales of diesel forward um, in, a, in a significant way across a lot of European countries. But then people started to realize that diesel is even more toxic than petrol um, and that all happened at a time where electric vehicles really started to show scale and promise. So I think we need to be careful about demonizing and banning plastic and rushing into alternatives where we actually don't understand the downside and the impact. So understanding the capital costs and having a kind of a cost curve abatement methodology like we had for climate action, I think is going to be a big part of the solution and doing full life cycle analysis and all of the, I'm going to use the word competing, alternatives um, also should, should be a consideration. But polymers themselves, just to go back to how we're demonizing them at the moment, the issue is not so much how plastic performs in terms of preserving food and, and um, stopping it from going to landfill sooner than it would have otherwise. It's actually the end of life phase of plastic that is, that is the big issue at the moment. It's had an awful lot of innovation that has been cre cre improving its durability and that is why it's lasting for hundreds of years at the moment. So we must remember the biggest circular economy we've got, which is nature, and actually give nature the help that it needs, that if 
plastic winds up in the natural environment, it can be properly broken down, properly assimilated, which is probably the lowest capital cost thing we can do at the moment to help existing polymers fully biodegrade when they wind up in the natural environment, but make sure that the primary focus should be to get them recycled and used over and over again, which is where our business has benefited from the huge um, investment in R&D and the support of Imperial Innovations in, in London and why we're so incredibly excited about our particular mission to tackle fugitive plastic waste. So I think the global um, kind of landscape is, is, is starting to, to crystallize and I think would really benefit from a lot of the coalition building that we're talking about here today and remembering some of those principles that helped us deal successfully with climate action, but on this particular issue of, of plastic pollution um, more than any other. Absolutely, and if, if I have, I can, I'm seeing that uh, clock ticking over there, we have probably just about run out, but uh, you, you're right in a way, we need to change behaviors as well, and it's really the way we end, end up treating the plastic, that is what uh, the issue is. For example, there are large companies, companies like mine where I work with, uh, we are saying the next seven years, by 2025, we will take certain actions. We will not have anything which is not, uh, we'll have everything which is uh, recyclable uh, or compostable or reusable. Uh, we are also saying 25% of whatever plastics we use would actually come from uh, post-consumer waste, uh, post-consumer used uh, granules. So fundamental shifts like that will happen. Uh, will happen. Uh, I think governments are playing their part as well. Some of the legislative movement we see here in this country, uh, we may begin to uh, kind of uh, complain a bit that they are not implementable, we need this clarification and so on. But the, the basic intent is absolutely right, and that is bringing many people in this country. Uh, and many of them are actually in the room we have met uh, in the morning. Uh, of actually truly working with the government and in, in partnership so that we have a very robust uh, models of EPR into place. We are actually today, as we speak, working with them. And I am personally hugely optimistic that what will happen uh, as a result of all this kind of at times irrational behavior from uh, many parts of the ecosystem we work in would lead to a business which is intrinsically more sustainable for the future generation. So that's where I am. Thank, Thank you. you very much, gentlemen. Very powerful thoughts there. We need a Paris for plastics, and yet we mustn't demonize it too quickly. We've just scratched the surface there, I think, but I know there's much more to come later in the day, so thank you. Thank you. Over to both of you ladies, Shamina and Ranana Ben. I know, Shamina, you're a great believer in the power of networks that power the modern world. And I know also that the center is doing fantastic <laughs> work in India on financial inclusion and literacy, particularly of women. Renana Ben, you need no introduction. You have been fundamental to the growth of a movement in India, which today has 1.4 million women in its tribe. I would just love to hear a little bit more from both of you about the future of work and what the implications are for women, if any in particular. So, yeah. <coughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a real honor and a privilege to be um, on stage with you. So thank you for letting me sit next to you and have this conversation. Um, everybody, I'm Shamina Singh, and I just, uh, I'm delighted to be here. And I think uh, you'll hear my accent. I was actually born and raised in the United States. And so, but um, my name indicates that I have some Indian affiliation. So maybe I have a little bit of credibility to talk to the audience. I don't think not that much. <laughs> But what I am doing here is I am representing my CEO, Ajay Banga, who has a lot of credibility to, uh, to, to speak not only here, but, but globally. Why is MasterCard interested in this conversation at all? Um, to to Shubha's point, uh, MasterCard is a company that's built on networks. It's a network that uh, connects buyers and sellers in 210 countries who can't see each other. So it's a network built on trust. Fundamentally, that's what we're talking about here. As, Os as Oswald said earlier, this is a game about individuals. So everybody in here, including everybody up here, represents individual pieces of this puzzle called humanity. And we're all here to figure out what our role is, both individually and collectively, to address issues that are <coughs> impacting all of us globally. So the reason I'm sitting at MasterCard and the reason why we started something called the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth was because we do fundamentally believe that there are these networks that are driving the modern economy. And access to these networks determine your productivity. So we've already heard about productivity today. 
Your ability to maximize productivity or your ability to maximize your own potential determines things like your ambition, determines things like aligning ambition with potential, with prosperity, with profitability. All of these things are connected and, we're and we should be unapologetic about making those connections. When it comes specifically to women, and when it comes to all of the issues we're talking about here, you'll see among, I think, the speakers, that there is a set of things that, that you'll hear over and over again. So for example, uh, with Unilever, um, he's, uh, you've been incredibly articulate about the power of corporation, right, to re-identify. Unilever, among many companies, is one that um, exemplifies this kind of integration between sustainability and profitability. Um, because it makes both social sense and because it makes business sense. Ajay and Paul Pullman are very good friends and they talk about this a lot. Um, one of the partnerships that we have, and this does get to the, uh, the impact of women, is in Kenya, the idea of women having access to capital, being more productive in their ability to make money for themselves and their families is something that is incredibly important. Working with Unilever and putting the power of MasterCard together with the power of Unilever in Kenya, we're unlocking the potential of 40,000 small shop owners, the majority of whom are women, to access capital using things like proxy credit scores. Because all of these shop owners buy their product from Unilever. Unilever has the data that shows that they buy and sell and at what rate. We have the connection to the bank to say, can we take that data and use it as proxy for a bank to give loans at formal interest rates, reasonable interest rates, with 15-day grace periods. That unlocks capital. So whether you are a woman, a man, or a child in this instance, you can, the idea is how do you unlock capital? How do you unlock your ability to realize your productivity? And this is what this woman has done her entire life. So what we talk about is, it is an issue around gender, but the truth of it is, it's an issue around productivity. There's an information inequality gap that she's solving. It's a distribution model. Technology today is the great democratizer and the great equalizer. The question is, how are we distributing that knowledge in such a way, how are we distributing that tool in such a way that allows Renana Ben to realize the potential of all of the women that she's been so greatly serving for so many years. So ma'am, please, talk to us about what you're, what you're seeing. Well, <clears throat> uh, let me start with first thanking you all for welcoming, welcoming me here, because I do not come from a business, and I'm uh, sort of representing the poor women of this country, or the women who are working hard, have aspirations, but have not yet come into this growth model. And I do believe that it's not the government, I mean the government has a role, but it's not the government who can bring them in, it's the businesses which can really reach out to them and uh, untap, unleash the, the potential they have. Um, and so I think, you know, if we can make that bridge, that gap, um, make that divide smaller, we'll see a real unleashing of potential. Um, you talked about a gap, or about the um, differentials, and I'd like to sort of focus in on um, the real differentials which need to be bridged. And uh, Sanjeev Mehta talked, said, I really liked his figure, he said 55% of this country uh, consumes only 10% of the consumption, only has 10% of the consumption. I have another figure, which is that 65% of the people live below what is called the vulnerable line. So that is, there is a subsistence poverty line, which is, which we used to be, there used to be a very large population under that. We've grown, we've overcome that, the destitution and subsistence. Um, but we still have, 65% uh, living under, not subsistence, but a real vulnerability. So, um, and so that's lower 65% uh, 
is where the potential lies and which will push growth in the country. And the other big divide is the gender gap. So we have overcome health, education, but there are huge gender gaps in the economy. So I think the labor force participation rate is something like 25% for women and falling, um, whereas it's something like nearly 75 to 80% for men. So women are not really in the economy. They want to be. They are capable of being, but they haven't reached. So where is the... Where are the game changers? Where is what can come into them? How do we reach out to them? And I'd like to just take one or two quick uh, examples. One is the new, the new generation. We are a young <coughs> country, but we are also a much more educated country. And these young girls are learning. There are, we have a huge population of young girls who have passed secondary school and then nothing. So between secondary school and the workforce, between high school and the workforce, we need to bridge that gap, which we can do if we look much more at digital means. And the other is that women are working, but they're working at the lowest manual productivity levels. So small farms, they're all doing manual work, earning practically nothing. We have seen, you bring in mechanization, you bring in information technology, and both their productivity and their earnings go way up. Mm -hmm. And it's not only their productivity, it's the opening of their minds. It's their aspirations. They become so entrepreneurial, which they already had, right. but you're giving them the opportunity. So how can we do that together? That's, I think, the question. I have an idea. <laughs> As Oswald a big would idea. Say, I have an idea. My dear. <laughs> um, the, uh, it's interesting. The, and I think we're both we're saying the same thing in the sense that right now the technology is just, and especially in countries like India, is leapfrogging yes. everywhere else because there aren't the legacy systems and there aren't the entrenched systems that we find in the West. So it's much easier to launch and to innovate here uh, than and in many other, many other places. So, for example, um, we're working with uh, the government, actually, of Andhra to uh, launch a product serving 500,000 smallholder farmers that allows, and this is, again, many of whom are women, um, allows them to negotiate the market rate for their, whatever their crop is, without having to leave their farm. So we've digitized the process of connecting market to farmer. Um, for women, this is hugely impactful because they don't, they have less of an ability to leave the farm, travel to the market, negotiate the market, hope the price stays the same, and then deliver the product and then come back. Mm -hmm. So this allows, this is called Kionect. Uh, it's a technology that, it's a very simple technology that allows the marketplace to issue the order for how much they need and, and what price they're willing to pay. And then collectively across the network, the farmers bid and say, I have this much, I have this much, I have this much, I have this much. So it allows them to aggregate the amount of the crop for the marketplace. So this connecting women and small smallholder farmers to the marketplace is a massive connection that I think will raise the productivity brought because of the technology of trying to figure this out. So these are the types of leapfrogs that I think we're seeing happening instantaneously. And so, for me, at least, I think that the problem is one of speed and how do we get these things to market as quickly as possible? Because there is no time to waste. Yes. Um, I think that's a great idea. And uh, how do we carry it forward? 80% of women are in agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, they would love this, but th the access to the technology would be a real a jump for them. Yes. But then we have all these educated girls. Yeah. So how do we combine the two right. all over the country? Right. That'd be wonderful. It's a great challenge. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Lots to think about there. Yeah. Think distribution, you say, Shamina, yeah. and think technology, perhaps to accelerate. Thank you very much. A <laughs> lot for us to build on there. Now I turn to our final pair for this morning, Nasser and Ritu, and we shift topics. Nasser, you're in a rare position. A rare position. Yes, I think so. A pioneer in Indian banking, 
the first CEO of HDFC and IDFC, and now serving in notable positions in philanthropy, banking, and the corporate sector more widely. Ritu, CDC, an institution that is equally long in terms of its history, one that successfully evolved time and again to meet the needs of the market. It would be wonderful to hear from both of you about what you think the funding for impact landscape is now and how you see it evolving. Sure. I think, Ritu, you should start with the CDC model. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm really honored to be here. I'd like to thank Zinto for inviting CDC and me to speak on this occasion. And especially to speak with Nasir, who also has an association with CDC yes, in some ways. So it's great to be here. Thank you very much. So I just want to start by, say, by sort of reiterating something that I heard this morning from both Oswald and Harry. Um, and they said that there are sort of a lot of small projects and very impactful, impactful ones. And the challenge is really to scale them up. And I think that is absolutely, you know, the core of the problem. And one of the reasons why it's difficult to scale up these really good projects is that very often they don't meet the financial hurdles of large corporations or investors. And that's something that we face at CDC as well, is how do we actually invest in a project that is not meeting our financial hurdles? You know, we are investing taxpayers' money and we have an obligation uh, uh, to return some of that uh, money to back to the taxpayer. So how do we overcome this financial hurdle? Um, and one of the ways that we in CDC are thinking of and have been experimenting with, and some of it successfully, some of it still work in progress, is how do we bring together human capital in organizational structures that can deliver both return and impact. And that impact can be any of the four waste, any of the four work streams that Zinto is looking at. So it could be plastics, recycling, it could be skilling women, youth, it could be waste to energy, it could be providing energy access. But how do we combine that impact with a financial return that is attractive? Um, so I think that is a challenge that we need to sort of think about. Uh, and we in CDC have been working along these lines, and I can speak a little bit more about some of the examples that we have. But I'd like to ask Nasir, because I know he has some ideas as well. So, Nasir. Well, first of all, let me thank Oswald and the whole Zintao team for inviting us here. Um, um, let me just say that, given a background where my first job was as the first employee of HDFC, and I'm still on the HDFC board, and I still chair the audit committee of HDFC 40 years down the road. When we started, when we started, nobody believed we'd succeed. In fact, a lot of groups, some of them represented here, refused to invest in us. Not a penny. When we did the first equity issue of 10 crores in those days in 77. Today, if you talk about impact, and I'm just going to confine my uh, uh, remarks to impact. Funding is one part of it, but impact. Look at the impact that HDFC had on housing finance and retail finance in India. From a one man's idea, and he fought 10 years to get that idea accepted in India. It took him 10 years. And we were the first retail finance institution in India. Today, the HDFC group is a $70 billion group with the bank, HDFC, Standard Life, uh, uh, the asset management company. Huge. From nothing. We started from nothing. So that was my first example of impact, you know, of, of, of something that was really essential to the Indian environment, which is housing and housing finance. So that made it possible. The second impact in my career was IDFC. When I was asked to set up an infrastructure company in India, where 90%, 99% of the infrastructure was government. And we wanted to create a private investment 
profile for infrastructure in India. And that was insane. They said, how are you going to do it? But everything you see in infrastructure today in India was the work we did in 97 to 2004. That was the first time we did public-private partnerships and brought the public sector, the private sector together to invest and create the environment, say, for the ports. The first ports were done under our process. The first roads were done under our process. The whole civil aviation policy was written by us. The airports were done by us. So all the groundwork for what you're seeing today was done in 1997 to 2004. That is impact. That's changed everything. Nothing much has happened in the last 10 years apart from carrying on what we did. No new ideas have seemed to come on the, on the, on the stage. But the, the work that was done then, even output-based contracts based on the PFI in Britain, uh, created a funding. Funding was never a problem. How you did it became a problem. And when I look at partnerships and are defining partnerships, when I look back, public-private partnership, this concept wasn't even talked about in India. Now when I look back and say, was it really successful? I say, well, it was partially successful. But what I really regret is the last P didn't exist. Partnership. So the po most powerful idea, I think, for impact is partnership. It became public-private contracting. It's a very different thing from a partnership where we work together to create something that's much bigger than you can do on your, on your own. So that is roughly the sorts of impact we looked at. But I also straddle, I was, sit on the, I was on the Sir Ratan Tata <laughs> Trust, and now I chair the Arakan Foundation and the Arakan Rural Support Program. So a lot of my, half my life is in NGO work and half in corporate. So I think, you know, it's this straddling of both. And one story I'd like to tell you of the third level of impact that we've tried to do is AKRSP, which is the Arakan Rural Support Program, which was started 20, 30 years ago by the Arakan with a three crore endowment. Uh, it took us 25 years to raise that three crores per year program to 30 crores per year program. And we actually redefined rural development as you see it today. Whether it's rapid rural appraisal, joint forestry management, livelihoods, water tanks, the whole, uh, the whole salinity problem of coastal Gujarat, these were all problems we attacked 25 years ago. Now we've made an impact because you've, you've actually delayed that process. And you know, in a sense, with very little money, we had that impact. So for 25 years, we, and we were supported by DFID, by uh, CEDA, the Canadian International the European Union gave us the largest grant we've given any NGO in India, at that time 10 million euros. So that helped us. But when it all ended, we said, how does the institution survive? How do we move forward? So we said we have to look for funds. And that is where the funding side came in. And I, in a sense, in the last five years, at least for 25 years, we went from 3 crores to 30 crores. In the last five years, we've gone from 30 crores to 100 crores. So the scale has just gone through the roof. Why? Because of the new partnerships with the private sector. A lot of corporate support, a lot of help from corporate, uh, corporate income. So I think this is maturing. I think there's a long way to go. But I think what, when I sit on the company boards and look at our CSR work, etc., you sort of see, uh, you know, everybody's feeling around. You haven't quite gotten to what ought to be done. A lot of good work has been done. But the issue is, how do you do it systematically? And how can you do it to scale? Uh, and what are the sort of institutional areas? Because in the end, corporates will have to find people on the ground. Who's on the ground today? And it is finding those on the ground. I think that's really interesting. One of the things that we are uh, working with now is exactly how to provide this funding so that it provides an incentive for impact as well. And uh, you know, I can give an example of a, of a facility that we have now set up called the Resource Efficiency Facility in CBC, where you know we were struggling to help our portfolio companies that we invest in to become more energy efficient, to replace fossil fuels with uh, 
renewable energy within their operations. Uh, and you know, there was a lot of interest and um, companies wanted to do this, but somehow they wouldn't do it. You know, it wasn't a priority for them. They didn't have an incentive. There was always something else that was more important. So we then came up with this resource efficiency facility where we are providing below market debt to our portfolio companies for putting in place energy efficiency measures or for putting rooftop PV to replace fossil fuel uh, to the extent possible. And we have found that you know this little bit of incentive has actually got them going. Uh, we have a small sort of branch facility associated with it whereby we will provide technical assistance to do energy audits or feasibility studies which show what the payback will be. And the payback ranges from three months to three years max for energy efficiency. And that really gives them, uh, you know, shows them that this is, makes a lot of sense financially as well as environmentally and uh, developmentally. And we have got them to start doing this now, where we are providing very you know, low-cost loans uh, to do all of this. And once it's done, we hope to commercialize this and make it you know, uh, in, at par with commercial loans. So that's one of the sort of things that we are trying to do. And I think funding for impact is something that uh, you know, we feel is a responsibility of a development finance institution as well, to show the way. Thanks, Sam. Uh, last comments and criticism from my side. One is, as you look forward, as we as a town look forward, as you think, start thinking about the issues that you're facing, I just want to put two or three ideas on the table. As problems that are worrying me in terms of intellectually, how do you take things forward? Now, in terms of the AKRSP experiment, you know, the rural development experiment, and we're sitting on the ground, and I think nutrition is one of the biggest issues facing us, and it's a problem that can be solved in a matter of two years if we put our heads together. It's not rocket science. We know the issues. Now, why are we doing it? Why isn't it happening? And the question is, scale. How do you actually send it around? Who's going to do it? How is it going to get done? It's not the technical problem. It is the distribution problem. So in a sense, I have the five essays. Speed. India needs speed. We cannot say 10 years from now we will be where we are today in terms of our, the broader problems. We need scale. We need synergy. Because we can't do it, no one person can do it, the government can't do it, the NGOs can't do it, the sector, the corporates can't do it. How are we going to do it? Speed, scale, synergy. The fourth S is simplicity. How can we create simple solutions, finally, which are implementable at scale? They cannot be complex solutions. And the fifth is sustainability, which comes out of all of these four that you do. So if you do this properly, you have sustainability. So this is my problem. That, for example, in AKRSP, how do I take things to scale where we really make impact? We know what's to be done on the ground in a small way, but how is it that we can take it? One experiment in Bihar has worked. When I first worked in Bihar, there were no electric lights. There were no electric poles. The, even the cables had been stolen. So when, you, when we had Samastipur and we are in um, uh, Muzaffarpur, when I first went there, it was, I was in tears. I have never seen people so destitute. Even the poorest of Gujarat don't compare to Bihar. And I've wondered, I've been right there, I go there regularly, twice a year, been looking at our programs very vigorously. In five years, we've transformed the community is a piece in which we work. Now, because of the power problem, we started putting in, people could even charge their phones. When you charge your phone, you don't have power. So we, we actually brought light into the home through lanterns, and we have small entrepreneur women's groups running a whole business on lanterns and charging, in a sense. That actually brought light into the home. And then, you know, we started from there. Of course, we were doing our early childhood and all the other programs that we normally do. Then we started to do uh, solar irrigation, where 
we created a model of community managed price solar irrigation systems so that even the power didn't have to disrupt that. The Chief Minister of Bihar came to see this program a few months ago and he was astounded. He said, I want this replicated throughout the world as a government. So he's wanting us to help teach him. Now, this is one way to scale. You, know, you take one idea and it just goes to scale. And it actually solves a major problem. Now, I'm trying to think of how we take something which, which is done on the ground, great action experiment, great action learning, take it to scale. Then what is the corporate contribution here? In fact, a lot of private-private partnership can be seen also looking at how we can take this to scale. So this is one big issue in terms of how you take something which you know how to do on the ground to scale. It's not in reinventing the wheel. You've actually done it. It works. How do you take that? So that's the first problem. The second problem, and I think this is where we too comes in really, because the last thing she mentioned was development finances. One idea to put forward is I've always felt that what India did um, um, actually uh, rather hastily was to disband our development finances. Today we don't have BFIs. The IDBI is gone, the ICICI is gone, all of them are gone. And the present entrepreneurs of today, of yesterday, were built by the BFIs, not the banks. Reliance, SR, you name them. Uh, the Muffet Law Group, even the Bill Law Group, the other group benefited from it. The development banks actually built the whole fabric of today's big industrial units here in India. Then we disbanded them. They became banks. The question I'm asking is what is going to replace them? And should we replace them? Or is it just the impact funds and the uh, private equity that's actually going to do the job for us? Or do we need a new development institution? I won't call it a bank, but a development finance institution for the new entrepreneurs of tomorrow. And today the ideas in India are brimming. There's so many ideas, amazing stuff happening, but they just can't find the light today. But is there an institutional response to this? And can we build and it, or can we think through a development finance institution which will take marketing, technical prowess, um, equity, mezzanine debt, pre uh, prevent, uh, uh, save entrepreneurs from giving away too much equity too early. So there's a whole range of things we can think about in terms of an institutional response. Because in India there is no institutional response today for the new entrepreneurs of tomorrow. And in a sense, if you read, read if your last point is that if, if you can see what really worries me about growth, and this is the new growth that we're talking about, is jobless growth. Jobless growth is the is the is, is what's happening. Today, if you look at the formerly employed people in India, how many are there? In the formal sector? 35 million people. That's it. And 35 million has remained constant over the last five years. So the new growth has not raised the jobs. 300 million people are in the informal sector. They actually want the livelihood of the informal sector. And if you affect the informal sector in some ways, you're going to get into real, in fact, demonetization and GST is affecting the informal sector negatively in a number of ways. So the issue now is, how do we look at that huge chunk of the informal sector? Because the jobless, the job growth is not going to happen, whether you like it or not. How much is 35 million grow to? 40 million? It hasn't done it for five years. Is it going to do it in the next five years? So the issue now for us is the freelance economy, the new entrepreneurship. In fact, I, I'm chairman of the Goa Institute for Management. <coughs> And I'm now bringing in this whole issue of how students should be looking at entrepreneurship, startups, and how you manage these processes. So just seeking jobs in the future is not going to be the answer. So we have to rethink. Final word, please. 
look at principle-centered leadership. We talk about leadership, and this leadership is a very important part of Zinta. But how do we celebrate principle-centered leadership? And if you look at sustainability, it's the principle-centered leaders around the world that have brought innovation because they're valued it, they're concerned, they care, something happens. Take away the principles, and then we don't have the leadership 